You being the manager of comedy sports, you were in a unique position to see all the other different cities mm -hmm. of comedy sports. Mm -hmm. Taking Quad Cities out of it, because obviously you'd be partial, which city was your favorite comedy sports? Wow. Wow, are you going to have to make a public statement about my favorite comedy sports Hot take. City? Hot take. <laughs> um, well, let's see. There's a lot of there's a lot of really solid arenas out there. Uh, I, I mean, honestly, I, I one of my favorites is the uh, Milwaukee Arena. Mm. Um, you know, Milwaukee being the home of comedy sports, um, it just had a great the the bleacher feel, the um, you know the the stadium aspect of it. I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, Chicago comedy sports was a fun room to play as well. Um, you know, they just, uh, it was very professional, um, clean room, good sight lines. Um, those are great rooms to play. Um, but, you know, the, the, it's hard to pick one because the thing is, is that each style, it's like its own flavor of ice cream. You know, each sure. city's its own flavor of ice cream. You know, we have things that, that, you know, make us similar, but each room, it's got its own little quirks. Um, so, but yeah, I would say the Milwaukee, um, the Milwaukee arena always is going to have a special place for me too, especially when I was younger, you know, when I finally got a chance and opportunity to start traveling and, and doing shows, um, you know, for transportation issues, it was always the easiest and most accessible, accessible to go to like Kansas City, uh, Green Bay, uh, Milwaukee, Chicago, Indianapolis, you know, those places, but, uh, you know, having a chance to, um, you know, be on the East Coast and the West Coast as well. Um, you know, the, those rooms, um, it's just a different feel. It's just a different flair. Um, I mean, each city's kind of known for its own thing, too, you know, mm -hmm. at least back in my day. Uh, back in my day, <laughs> each city was known for its own thing, you know. I mean, you had, like, L.A., which was a monster musical city, you know, and you, and you knew that if they picked a musical game, um, chances of you winning were, were like, one out of ten. Right. Um, so, you know, each city kind of had their own thing that they were known for as well. So. Absolutely. What's your favorite show that you've seen? And it could be just a specific comedy sports show that sticks out into your head that's your favorite, or it could be a outside show that you've seen and you were like, wow. There are so many. Uh, I know I definitely have seen some outside shows that were like, wow. Um, you know, like watching TJ and Dave was a fantastic mm -hmm. experience. Um, you know, but uh, as far as my career, the ones that stand out, I mean, there there are so many for so many different reasons. But when you ask that question, one of the first things that popped in my head was, um, you know, I told you about the musical day in the life. We had done something similar. We had done played that game and uh, the audience volunteered, don donated a story that uh, their father had um, just died and mm -hmm. uh, they just had attended the funeral a couple of days ago. And not not something that you generally would expect to receive as a story at a comedy show. Right. Um, but when there's nothing else being offered, and obviously this is a very real and personal experience for this person, and for some reason they wanted to share it. Mm -hmm. Maybe they thought for the shock value it was funny, or maybe it was therapeutic, but whatever it was, in that moment we had to accept that story with respect and the delicate gloves that it needed, get the information... And then figure out how do we reenact this story where the dad and the daughter are both heroes in this. Sure. And we were able to pull it off. And that, to me, was the truest testament of, you know, a group of, of like-minded people working together towards a goal I mean, we were flying by the seat of our pants, but we knew that we had to, to honor both of them and make this entertaining, but make it one where it's a, a tribute to someone that's lost. Um, we couldn't make any fun at the expense of anyone. Sure. Um, and being able to do that just, I mean, that was a powerful moment. That was great. Um, another show that really stands out for me, too, was the very, um, very first night that we performed a show called Bandwagon. Um, Bandwagon was a, a musical uh, improv show. Uh, I had two guitar players, a percussionist, a keyboard, uh, a bass player, and um, we played all of our instruments live as if we were a band that was reuniting after you know twenty years apart. Mm -hmm. So we in, engaged the audience as if they were at our reunion concert. 
played a few songs live for them where we you know, truly improvised the music. Uh, the song titles came from the audience. And then after that, uh, we would show the backstory of the band and how they got together, how they fell apart, how they reunited. Um, and being able to blend all of that together with some of my most you know trusted friends really was like a peak experience for me because it was such a challenge. It was like skydiving, you know, it's like you don't know if you're going to live or you're going to die. You just know it's going to be exciting. And then when you're done, you're like, I'm here. I'm like, I'm still alive. <laughs> Everything's here and all the people, and I'm thrilled and I want to do it again. And that was that feeling with Bandwagon and, and it happened. I mean, it was special on that first night, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like that's one of the things that I fell in love with improv was we could ask these questions like name something that your boss has said to you that got on your nerves and you have that opportunity to express that in a safe space mm -hmm. and then we can use that and twist it and uh, maybe it makes you feel better about your day and it is therapy in a way you know mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's so many times on stage I've worked through my issues that was just on stage but it was really going on in my life and I didn't have to talk to a therapist about it because we just worked it out and obviously like I can't do what we did on stage in real life mm -hmm. because that's so fantastical but uh it, it's fun to imagine in your head oh, yeah. you know well, comedy is very therapeutic. Sure. I mean, we all, you know, I think it's kind of widely accepted that a lot of comedians have a lot of things to work through, <laughs> uh, and that comedy is one avenue to to get that done. And I certainly have, um, you know, I've seen performers do just that too. Like you can you can tell, especially with, with a, com a comedy partner that you've worked with for years, and you know you know what's going on behind the scenes, and you see a little bit of that real life come out. Um, even though that you know you're you're playing the part of a, a bald eagle on top of a mountain, but but a little bit of that real life comes out, and it, it makes sense that it does too, because you know obviously we're we're grabbing ideas, we're creating you know in the moment, and sometimes things from our real life are going to leak in because it's uh, it's going to be one of the first ideas that maybe crosses your mind, and you just accept that idea, and put it through a filter, and into the scene. Absolutely. Right? Uh, Patrick, if you were to start your own improv group for fun, uh, not to make money, just some guys doing their thing on stage, one, what would the name of it be? And two, would there be like, you know how there's improv Shakespeare or Dick Wolf Shakespeare, would it be a genre like that or would it just be you guys having fun on stage? I haven't put any thought into this, John. <laughs> so, an idea I just had, as okay. I think it would be awesome to have a show where we have a live, we have like a large screen, not necessarily a live screen, but we have a large movie screen, um, you know, something that everybody in the audience can see. And I think that what we need to do is we need to randomly watch like three to five TikTok videos. And then we use those TikTok videos to create you know, a 15 minute uh, uh, improv piece. Then we watch three more TikTok videos, but we only watch the TikTok videos uh, that we find, they're the top videos, after we search from a prompt from the audience. And then we use those to create our story, and then we weave those together throughout the night. Uh, and I'm going to uh, call it um, TikTok Dead Ass. <laughs> no, <I don't. laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna call it uh, we're gonna call it uh, TikTok because uh, we're gonna take TikToks. I'm gonna have to work on that uh, name. No, but, that's... Uh, but yeah, you know, I think the format will work. It just hit me. Absolutely. Um, no, yeah, that would be a great format. Um, I would love to incorporate multimedia. I think right now where the audiences are is that the the improv groups that are finding a way to incorporate multimedia or incorporate uh, you know how we interact with each other on the daily you know with our social media connections um, I think those are going to find more relatable audiences and younger audiences mm -hmm. um, you know I feel that if 
and certainly I saw in my career, um, different areas that we, we failed to adapt to the technology and the way that people were consuming their entertainment mm -hmm. that would have helped us stay more current and relevant with younger audiences, which is always what's great for you know any business wants to have a replenishing and continuous you know uh, consumer. Patrick, as an OG in improv, mm -hmm. do you have any words for anyone who's starting their journey in improv? Mm -hmm. Yep. So an improv teacher, Joe Bill, um, had a lesson, uh, bring a brick. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know if we're you know building an outhouse or a cathedral, but we're not going to be able to bring either unless you bring a brick. You know, that, that brick is an idea. Uh, we have to have something to offer. Um, as well as being in a receptive state. So we have to be able to listen and to offer as well. So five statements of consequence. Um, when I thought about that concept of, of bring a brick, there's a lot of times as an improviser that there's a moment of, of panic. It, it may be a very brief moment, you know, 0.2 seconds of panic in your brain. Uh, it may be imperceivable to the audience, but as an improviser you think, I have nothing. There's just darkness right now in my brain. And so I was able to come up with some different statements that really helped me in my career to get through those moments. And I think that they've been very valuable lessons to people I've coached as well. So one of those statements um, is simply making a declarative statement, making a declarative statement, um, saying um, it's hot in here today. It's an observation. It's just making an opinion statement. Um, another thing um, would be to say, to start your, your next line, when, you, when your brain goes blank, you say, that's because. When you say that's because, or its alternative would be that means, you're now going to have to finish that sentence. And saying that means or that's because engages our brain to relate what we just saw with some sort of explanation or expectation. And so we're able then to fill in that blank. If somebody says to you, yeah, it's hot out here today, and you say, that means the cake is going to melt. We're going to have to get all the desserts inside before the picnic starts. Uh, you know, somebody says, that's hot. Uh, it's hot today. And you say, that's because of the sun. Sit down. I need to teach you some things about life. Um, you know, you fill in that blank. So that means, that's because, a declarative statement. And then the two others um, are you always or you never. Saying you always dot 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 um, is going to allow you to then make a statement that expresses not only a personality trait of the person that you're interacting with, but also gives a sense of history as well. And you never does the same thing. It's just really the positive way or, or, or the negative way of saying it. So you always, you never, that means, that's because, or just a declarative statement are the ways that are going to be able to trick your brain to get over that, that little brain fog and to start to bring that brick, have something to say, bring a piece of information that's relatable. For me, improv is always about being... A juggler. It's about being a balancing act. It's how do I listen as much as I'm speaking? How do I give as much detail that matches the level of my quietness so that I'm listening and engaging? How can I show the audience what I'm doing rather than tell them about it? How can I tell them just enough so that when I show it to them, it all makes sense? And it's really, to me, was always about a balancing act. And so being in a receptive state, being in almost like a flow-like state, um, is something that all the improvisers really seek to, to, to achieve while they're performing. Um, and that starts with listening and knowing that you've done enough work in workshop and then practice that you have the tools necessary in your tool belt to overcome these situations where your brain panics. Thank you very much, Patrick. Hey.
Hey, you're welcome, John. <laughs> wow, other things to say. Good, John, I'm gonna have John do this for a long time. <laughs> um, I can't pull myself away. Uh, no, the other uh, one I always like. The other one I always like too, John. Uh, and and is uh, where where the beep is celery.